that I address this issue, yeah? Therefore, we should change our opinion much, much earlier. Now, somehow problem, okay. If you look in magazines, then you are familiar with these pictures here in the center, that there is something like a plastic plaque in the world. And what you see here on the photo are somehow fishes which swim around a plastic bag. And these fishes are definitely not trained to distinguish between a plastic bag and between food. Yeah? Well, very, very important issue. And if you look today around 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic enter the sea every year. It's a huge number. 8.8 .8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean. I'm now talking about microplastic. Yeah? And then from the microplastic, after years, we get microplastic. So, and this plastic, which is entering the sea, is killing millions of animals. We are all aware of this. From National Geographic, I summarized some shocking facts about plastic. And I think this is a good introduction for this talk that more than 5 trillion pieces of plastic, we are talking about 5 trillion pieces of plastic are already floating in our oceans. Worldwide, 70% of beach litter is plastic. More than 40% of plastic is used just once. And the reason for this is, this plastic is very light, plastic is very cheap, and to recycle this, it's expensive. Yeah? Therefore, uh, companies decide that in the wrong way, they decide that we use, for example, packaging material only once. Around the world, nearly a million plastic beverage bottles are sold every minute. And I mean, if you look on the advantages of such a plastic bottle, it's light. Yeah? So to transport uh, the water, you need much less gasoline as with a glass bottle. So the, there is a big advantage of plastic bottles. But if we throw the bottles on the street, we most probably make mistakes. So estimates for how long plastic ensures range from 450 years to forever. I don't agree with this statement in National Geographic. It depends on the plastic. Some of the plastic degrades very quickly, other plastics forever. It is a question where the plastic is. Is it on top of an ocean or is it on the ground in 10 kilometer deepness? Yeah, but this is a report from National Geographic. Some 700 species of marine animals have been reported so far to have eaten or become entangled in plastic. So normally, if you eat five grams of plastic per day, then you eat it and it gets out, like the normal food. <laughs> yeah. But with some animals, uh, some of this plastic might also enter your body in a way that you find plastic in your blood. And meanwhile, there are scientific papers where they found microplastic in human being blood, not only in animal cells. So by 2015, and it's, it's incredible, virtually every seabird species on the planet will be eating somehow plastic. Now, from this, we should really avoid plastic. No question. But if you look on the pandemic, can you imagine this pandemic without plastic? If you look in this uh, hospital fuse, it's impossible without plastic. I mean, there are so many advantages of plastic, and I only want to show you one, these syringes. 
these plastic syringes are sterile, they are very secure, and they are inexpensive. And this company, B. Brown, in Germany, called B. Brown Medical, they sold only 2000, 2020, two billion, two billions of these syringes. And therefore, uh, to get rid of plastic is somehow impossible. And you see, only 2% uh, of the plastic goes into medical applications. Yeah, but in this field, it's extremely important. Now, we are talking about coronavirus. Then, meanwhile, you find everywhere masks on the ground. Yeah, and if they are on the ground, nobody picks them up because you don't know what is on the mask. Therefore, uh, there's one thesis that plastic is not bad, but the way how human handle plastic waste is not correct. And we really have to change this. But this is also a very important political issue. And maybe some of you heard some weeks ago a statement uh, from an American politician that weapons are not bad. The way how human handle weapons is not correct. Then it gets a little bit crazy. Yeah, I mean, we can easily get rid of weapons, but we cannot get rid of plastic. We need this material. Otherwise, uh, we would have a, a tremendous decrease in our living standard. Now, if you look on the success of plastic materials, then it's interesting to look on the volume of plastic, not on the tons of plastic. So this is a diagram which shows you the worldwide consumption of plastic from 1950 to 2010. And if you look or compare this with the consumption of steel and aluminum, then you see that the volume of plastic is increasing the volume of steel in 1980 by volume. Yeah, you, you see here the different densities of the materials and uh, aluminum is the amount is very low. But what does this mean? This is a plastic production worldwide in million tons from 1950 to 2015. So you see here in 2018, the success of plastic started. So the curve gets very steep because uh, the production uh, facilities worldwide have increased significantly. Now, if you look on the area under the curve, then we are talking about 8.3 billion tons of plastic within 65 years. This means in a very short time, 8 billion tons of plastic were produced. It, it, I have no idea how much 8 billion tons of plastic is. It's a lot. It's definitely a lot. And uh, today in 2021, we are on a level of 360 million tons per year. 360 million tons per year. And I like to mention at this point, the production of bioplastic is today in the range of 1 million ton. Yeah, so it means if we start now with bioplastic to substitute the regular plastic with bioplastic, it needs 20 years to get somehow uh, in this curve. Yeah, so it needs a long time until we have enough production plants to substitute the regular plastic with bioplastic, which might be biodegradable. Now, when we are look, there are people who are looking on what happened with the plastic. And uh, so this is a diagram, it's a reference, uh, it's a little bit hidden by, by uh, the Zoom uh, program, that from the 8 billion tons of plastic, 
we guess that about 4.9 billion tons are somehow discarded. So huge amount is landfill, yeah, but we don't know how much landfill we really have and we don't know where the rest is. So it's a very huge amount. And if you look on this a little bit more in detail with this figure, then we have 8 billion tons in 65 years. In use actually are 2.5 billion tons of plastic. And please, if you look on plastic windows, they are used normally for 20 years in buildings. It's completely different than a plastic bag, which you use, maybe you don't use them anymore, you use paper bags. So then we know that 800 million tons got incinerated and uh, the incinerated plastic or incineration, then we can get back the energy out of the plastic and we can heat, uh, use this energy, for example, for heating. So therefore we assume that 4.9 billion tons are in the environment and uh, 100 million tons are in the second use and 600 million tons have been recycled. And this means in general, we have worldwide a recycling rate of 70%. And this is really a shame for the society. These recycling rates are different in different countries. Yeah, but uh, it needs a long time to change this worldwide that we go from a recycling rate. I, I know from the United States, it's 35%. Yeah, so that also China has 35% or India has 35% recycling rate. And you must also see that uh, there are cultures on the world, people with we all have different cultures. There are people who are used to throw everything in, in, in the river. That's is normal. Yeah? And so to change this is a very long process because you completely have to change the education of the people. But if you look on this picture here from Indonesia, 80% uh, of the water from Jakarta is provided by this river. And this river is extremely high polluted. And uh, there's another point I want to make with this picture. You know, plastic is only swimming if the density is less than one. Yeah? So maybe it could be an advantage that we try to produce plastic, which is foamed, which has a lower density so that it swims because if the plastic is swimming on the ocean or on a lake, we have a chance to use equipment, clever equipment, to get rid of the plastic which is on top. Yeah, but if it's falling down, for example, fiber reinforced composite and this stuff, similar like glass or metal, then it's somewhere on the ground and it's very, very difficult to get this material back from the ground and there's a very strong interaction with animals on the ground of a river. So farming might be a small solution. So this means in according to United Nations, there's a environment assembly say state that between 15, 5 and 10 million tons of plastic per year are somehow introduced into the oceans. And uh, this are mostly data. So they stated this 2017. These are mostly data from 2010. Because if you look on the data, which you can Google, for example, then you see uh, most of the information we get were collected in 2010. And we don't have only very little information about 2018 or 2020. But there are estimations uh, by scientists that depending on how good our recycling rate is, uh, in 2025, we might have 100 to 250 million tons per year, which go into the ocean. I cannot imagine, but, but it's incredible. Yeah? That's what scientists are stating. So therefore this amount which goes to the ocean will increase in a 
very high magnitude by 2025. So what are the consequences I already mentioned? Uh, how do you distinguish between a uh, sea turtle and, and a plastic bag? And very interesting, for example, uh, that's something what you find on beaches that these mussels like to live on the surface of a Coca-Cola bottle. Yeah, and uh, so obviously a biofilm which forms on the surface of this Coca-Cola Coca bottle yeah, is uh, giving the same signal to the mussel like a biofilm on wood or a biofilm somewhere on a another natural material. Yeah. So obviously uh, these muscles feel well on uh, the surface because from the biofilm they get the food which they need. But if you look on this uh, turtle, he really carries a, a piece of uh, macroplastic because the odor of this macroplastic film is similar to food. And uh, therefore, we don't wonder that we find these pictures. For example, if we Google microplastic, you immediately get this horrible, really horrible pictures. So the question is, why do animals eat, plast eat plastic? And the problem is that the plastic surface provides a substrate for microorganism. And marine plastic debris is an excellent substrate for biofouling. And after biofouling, the odor is similar to food. So what's going to happen is a polyethylene bag, a bottle is in the ocean, then UV light is changing the surface of the polyethylene battle, bottle. Yeah? And then you have three radicals and on these three radicals, the biofouling starts. So there's a very nice uh, pick, uh, paper uh, which is uh, in regard to this biofilm development on plastic substrates. But if we really want to understand how microplastic is developing, then we need to know that lots of external factors are acting on plastic, which is, for example, laying on a beach. So you see this oil can and you have weathering and hydrolysis. You have mechanical stress Something what is very, very important is called environmental stress cracking. This means the complex inter interaction between mechanical forces and, for example, chemical uh, 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 solvents, for example, uh, diluted acid, yeah? uh, they introduce cracks in the plastic and by this, the cracks are propagating in the material. So we already talked about biofilm formation, we have temperature change changes, and we have a lot of UV radiation. So this gives you an idea about how the degradation of such a bottle, which is in this case made of a biopolymer, might happen. Yeah, so this is not a real picture because uh, if you degrade the material, you have to do this in a very special waste. But you see, after a certain time, it ends up as microplastic. And then later, we might have also something what we call, meanwhile, nanoplastic. So therefore, we are not surprised that these big bottles get somehow grinded down to small pieces. And uh, I personally, I was 1976 on the Isla uh, Galapagos. Uh, I went there by ship from Guayaquil and I really had the sand from these islands in my hand and it was as colorful like this. But at this time it was grinded corals. This means the corals in Galapagos have so many different colors that you have a colorful sand coming from the different colors of the corals. And now uh, we have a colorful sand where the colors are coming from microplastics. This is absolutely ridiculous. So 
going a little bit more in detail, there is a classification of plastic particles. And uh, I think you are aware that we define macroplastic as pieces which are larger than five millimeters. Microplastic is defined as pieces which are smaller than five millimeters. And there's a de definition for nanoplastic. These are pieces which are smaller than one micrometer. This means these microplastics are tiny particles that result from commercial product development and they are coming from larger plastics. So if you look in more detail on the beach and you see crannels, you see filaments, you see foam parts, you see films. So Hola. <laughs> Welcome to the talk. <laughs> yes, she's doing her job. Very good. <laughs> Perfect way. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> keep going. Okay, I keep going. So therefore, uh, maybe you wonder why microplastic is defined not as particles smaller than one micrometer. And I also was wondering until I met Professor Richard Thompson, he is somehow the gold godfather of microplastic. And he defines this, uh, he is not a plastic expert, but what he did was that he was looking on the size distribution of plastic on the beaches. And by this, he found this definition as the best suitable definition. And uh, so he decided that we have this classification today because he wrote some of the first papers. And in these papers, he defined microplastic as something which is smaller than five millimeters from his observations of plastic on beaches. Yeah? So you can read his papers. And this is a picture of him. So therefore, we are producing macroplastic, but we are also producing microplastic. For example, you know these plastic granules which we put in injection molding machines. But for example, in uh, some parts of the industry, they use small plastic particles to control viscosity. Yeah, and this is, for example, this was very famous in cosmetic industry that they put small uh, particles into the cosmetics uh, to make sure that, for example, Nivea cream is the same viscosity in winter when you go skiing as in summer on the beach where you have 30 or 40 degrees Celsius. So therefore, there are, is a production of Macroplastic, and there's a production of primary microplastic. And uh, meanwhile, in most countries in the world, the production of primary microplastic is forbidden. Yeah, but even if something is forbidden, this does not mean that it's zero. And uh, the microplastic, which is coming from macroplastic, is called secondary microplastic. And this is what we find. Uh, in our uh, environment. So we have secondary microplastic and primary microplastic. And uh, there is from some literature an estimation that about 32 million tons of microplastic go into the environment per year, 10 million tons of secondary microplastic and two to five million tons of primary microplastic. But this is significantly going down, while uh, the secondary microplastic, we always have to think, needs time to develop. This means I have told you that 19, since 1950, we started to throw plastic into the oceans or into the environment. And so it needs 50, maybe 100, maybe 400 years that the plastic, the individual part, degrades to microplastic. Therefore, the microplastic that we find today in the ocean, we don't know 
when it was thrown into the ocean and how long it needed to develop to be microplastic. But there are facts that we know that worldwide, 35% of the secondary microplastic is coming from synthetic textiles. 28% is coming from car tires, from car tires. 24% is somehow related to city dust, road markings, marine coatings, personal care products, and uh, a small amount of plastic pellets. So this is what scientists found meanwhile, that the synthetic textile, or the microplastic coming from the synthetic textile is a very important issue. And you can overcome this issue by better water purification uh, uh, things in the cities. So in Germany, if you analyze the microplastic composition, uh, we have very, very little synthetic textiles in our water. Yeah, because the water purification is filtered without. But in under other countries, these textiles are very big. And for example, I know that Miele as a company who is producing washing machines, they are working on filters, which they can sell worldwide. So that from our textiles and like the tiny fibers don't get into the water anymore. So there are solutions. But again, in aquatic ecosystems, microplastic is somehow everywhere in lakes, rivers, and seas. Uh, if you take samples, you find microplastic, but you also find ceramic particles. Yeah, you also find some pieces of metal. So I mean, uh, but the problem is that we are talking here about a synthetic material. Now, uh, the University of Bayreuth in Germany is well known for a lot of research on macromolecules. This means we have about 40 professors which are somehow dealing with macromolecules. And uh, therefore, five, six years ago, we decided to start a research initiative on microplastic. And uh, the idea was that we wanted to understand the mechanism and the processes and the transport and the formation of microplastic. They are from a very basic view and uh, we were successful with our proposal. And so we got from the German Research Foundation five years ago, a research center, which has a number 1357. And this is on microplastic. And within this research center, we have 33 work groups 40 PhDs, which have the chance to work up to 12 years. This means such a special research field can be extended four times. Uh, then uh, you see here, these are mixtures of scientists. Some are chemists, some are biologists, some are uh, geoscientists, some are uh, physicists. So it's a strong mixture and uh, I'm uh, in this group as a mechanical engineer or as a polymer engineer. So this SFP is run by two of my colleagues, Christian Laforge and Andreas Greiner. So they are somehow the CEOs of this uh, SFP. And we structured this research in two columns. One column, the scientists are looking on biological effects. So what is the interaction? for example, between a bacteria and microplastic. So if we start to feed bacteria with microplastics and we see what is going to happen with the bacteria. So in the second column, we are looking on the migration of microplastics. So why do we find microplastic on the North Pole? Yeah, so what is responsible that we have a point where we develop microplastic and this microplastic goes everywhere? And the second, uh, excuse me, the third column is focusing on the formation and degradation of microplastic. This means we start with the bottle, and then at the end, we want to understand how the bottle is degraded into microplastic. And this we are doing for uh, different types of plastic. So I'm focusing with my talk today on this column.
to read. It's on the reconstruction and environmental degradation of polystyrene by accelerated weathering. This means we have weathering chambers where we put dog bone specimens in and where we put granules in. And then in the chamber, we have something like photo oxidation, we have humidity, and then we observe the fragmentation. And uh, then we see how, for example, the length of the macromolecules are changed because of the environmental influences. And so the first results are published in this paper. And uh, to show you the interaction between environment and plastic, I like to show you this video. Uh, I took this video uh, when I went uh, with my grandson to a playground. And so he is jumping here around this playground. And I observed this platform where the children enter this playground. Yeah, so when they jump on this platform, this platform is made of rubber, which is reinforced by fabrics made of polyester. So it is a very strong platform. But now, if you look on my video, then you see interesting effects. If you look in more detail, then you see a lot of scratches. Yeah? And these scratches are somehow coming because this rubber is always exposed to UV light. This rubber is exposed to uh, the acid rain, which we have in the city of Hamburg. So it's exposed to a lot of environmental effects. So now, if you observe this a little bit more in detail, yeah, then you see here the first pieces are gone from this platform. Yeah, so these are all points where small plastic particles are distributed within the city of Hamburg. Now, uh, if you look a little bit more, then here where this platform is fixed, you see that there is a high concentration of cracks because this is this interaction between external stresses yeah, and uh, the environment. And uh, therefore, you see uh, that in these areas, it's cylindrical. These are along the corners of the platform. And if we go here to the top, here we have the point where we have two load points. Then you see here that we have the highest stresses, also the highest concentration of these cracks. Therefore, this crack development and the structures of the cracks, we have to research yeah, if we want to understand how can we suppress the micro particle development? How can we get rid of this? Yeah. So this is uh, a picture of our environmental chambers. We have meanwhile three of them. And for example, in such an environmental uh, chamber, we put granules which have a diameter of 160 micrometers and we steer them in water in the presence of UV light. And this we are doing at 38 degrees. And in the chamber, we have a humidity of 55% and the particles are in water. And now if you look on these original particles, then you see that even after 400 hours in this environment, the first cracks have developed. And you see here, after 800 hours, these particles have more cracks on the surface. And then after 2,400 hours, it's absolutely clear that the shape of these 160 micrometer particles has changed completely. Yeah? So this means in such a climate chamber, you can accelerate and you can study the micro uh, particle development. So when we checked the average particle size, then we see a decreasing average particle size with the exposure time. You see how it works at the beginning. Uh, it has a different slope than after 500 hours. 
with the change particle size, we have a change particle size uh, distribution. And again, a linear decay and an exponential decay. And all particles are smaller than one micrometer after 2,400 hours. So if you look now on a dog bone specimen, which is sweet treated in the same way, and if you look only on the surface of this dog bone specimen, then you observe similar effects. This means after 800 hours, you have a rough crack structure, crack development. This is after 1,000 hours, after 1,400 hours. And if you look at a higher magnification, then you see that even in these domains, the next cracks are going to start. Yeah, so it's a very interesting phenomena which we can study with these experiments. So what we did in addition was that we use NMR spectroscopy to look on the development of functional groups with the exposure time. Yeah, and the development of these functional groups are extremely important for example, the interaction of these surfaces with biofilms or with bacteria or with fungi. Yes, therefore, if we combine this MIS NMR spectroscopy with our experiments, we see exactly what's going to happen. And uh, what you see here, we find with polystyrene, we find carbolysolic exits, we see peroxides, we see that cross links are happening within the polystyrene and we see ketones. Yeah, therefore, uh, they, these particles not only fragmentate, they also change their surface and by this the interaction with the environment. And so uh, my PhD student working on this field, Teresa Menzel, uh, she developed this schematic that you look only on this area of the dog bone specimen, what's going to happen in the machine is that somehow this UV light can go in a certain deepness within the specimen. Yeah, and by this deepness, uh, these cracks are developing in a special uh, thickness of the top layer. And then you see more and more cracks are developing. And then you need only small forces that these particles go away. Yeah, then you can also measure a reduction in the weight of the specimen. And at the end, it restarts again. Yeah, so this is what we concluded from this experiments. Therefore, if we look on this more general, our experiments, which we did, which I showed to you, are called abiotic degradation. This means it's only in the presence of UV light, we have hydrolysis, and we have somehow physical degradation. Yeah, but with other polymers, for example, with PET, or with polyolesins, or with biopolymers, we also might get something what we call a biotic degradation. And the biotic degradation, you don't get fragments, we get first bio deterioration, then we get biofragmentation, then we get assimilation, then we get mineralization. So this is a completely different step. Uh, but if we can mineralize plastics, this would be a huge advantage. Yeah? So then we get rid of the monomers. Yeah? And therefore, uh, many uh, researchers now, especially chemists, are studying these effects, how we can change the plastics which are in our daily use uh, to got, get more to this biotic degradation path. Therefore, summarizing my talk, fragmented plastic is globally distributed. Once a natural water recovery of microplastic is impossible, I told you it's possible what it's swimming on the top, we should get away. It's source of hazardous chemicals. This means if the pieces are getting smaller and smaller, then the additives which we have in our plastic can easier escape. Yeah? And some of these additives are not really healthy for human beings or for animals or plants. And if, for example, these chemicals 
are ingested by species in very well, every level of the food chain somehow is included because if the bacteria is eaten by a fish and we are eating the fish, then we also have these effects in our body. Therefore, uh, with primary microplastic, we need science to present observation of microplastic, this microplastic pollution. There is not very much work done on this, but we need movements to pressure police makers to regulate the industry. This means to stop primary microplastic production worldwide. We are talking about the secondary microplastics and we need to increase the understanding. And uh, very important, we need somehow zero waste strategies. And this is an ideal thinking of secular economy. And this we can only get if we give plastic waste value. Yeah, so for example, with PET bottles, they have a value and all P, uh, the recycling of PET bottles works very well. Yeah, so if we change the regulations, maybe we can uh, be more successful in suppressing secondary microplastic development. So design for recycling, it's very uh, important that we think about this microplastic uh, issue and that we address the challenges of cradle to grave so that nothing goes into the environment. And this is only possible by extending the producer responsibility. This means cradle to grave. If somebody uh, is producing a plastic part, then he is also responsible for the grave part of the life. Yeah, and for this all, we need new business develop, uh, new novel business solutions to develop more business around recycled plastic. Therefore, the mood today is plastic is bad for the environment, but if recycled responsibly, plastic can be used multiple times, and that's what we don't do. <laughs> that we are not do today. <laughs> this might be our future if we don't care for these issues. I don't know if it's today too late. Uh, we should start 30 years earlier. But uh, we are sure there is only one Earth. And what I personally see is between the left side and between the right side, there are more and more stress developing. Yeah, so if you see on young people who force old people to look more for environmental issues, then the old people say, no, 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 it costs money and we want to keep our living standard. While for me, the young people are on the right way to put pressure on these guys, which uh, are always in the past, these dinosaurs. So at the end, I'd like uh, to thank my PhD student, Teresa Menzel, she's working on this field and uh, she helped me to prepare this presentation. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to get your questions. Okay. Ah, I'll give you my microphone. <laughs> okay. Maybe keep it in the hand. Thank you, Volker, for your very good presentation and okay to introduce the problematic drill because uh, you will see that there are a lot of work to be developed to be clear about the effects and about the uh, principal ways to control this type of situation. But uh, we have time for question. Okay, uh, Juan Sebastián Hernández, thank you for your question. Do you know if there is any control of microplastic in food? Depends on the country. Uh, this means, uh, meanwhile, in in Germany, uh, they try to identify if there are plastic, for example, like PVC, yeah, which has more problems, yeah, in, in food. But it's very difficult to identify all these different types of uh, plastic what we have. Yeah, so you can look for. PVC microplastic or for polyethylene microplastic, but not for the whole 
bunch of different uh, plastic which is existing on the market. Yeah, but, but it's done for, for PVC. But I don't know how it's in Colombia or how it's in the United States. Okay. There are one local question now, but this is not really local, it's from Equator, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I saw in one of your slides that you said that around 27% of the microplastics that are introduced in the ocean are from yeah. dust in the city. What do you refer with that dust in the city? I mean, dust is uh, means this is somehow what is developing uh, from paintings, from 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 uh, breaks, from there's a lot of plastic uh, which contributes to the pollution. Yeah, it's uh, not only ceramic pieces from from the co uh, construction industry; it's also from the plastic industry. So. Uh, for example, if you start to grind something, uh, then you have also uh, small plastic pieces. Yeah. How do you quantify that? I don't know how they do this. You mean this picture here? Uh, city dust. Yeah. yeah? Because it's, it's a high amount, but uh, it, it's not easy to understand because it, these are the breaks, yeah. So there's, I mean, the breaks they contain epoxy resin, yeah. And so if you break, then you are developing dust, yeah. This is the same with trains, but uh, I think from construction industry, yeah, there is also a, a lot of plastic dust developing if you are uh, welding or if you are grinding. So. I guess that this contributes to this uh, city dust. Yeah, because you see here the car tires, this is friction and wear. Uh, the synthetic textile is clear, the road markings is clear, but for example, all the dust coming from brakes this must be a high amount. The yeah. Okay. Thank you, Volker. New question from Juliana Montoya. Uh, um, she asked about the oxodegradable additives yes. that we, uh, was employed uh, to stimulate nominally the biodegradation and which is the effect of this type of composite of additive in the in, uh, in the environmental reality and the effects of, of to produce microplastics. Uh, I don't really understand the question. This means there is an additive which you put the into poly. Nowadays, uh, like, uh, there are different kinds of plastic. Yes. Eco-friendly, okay, eco-friendly. Uh, this means this is bioplastic, yeah? And, bio and, and you might, the bioplastic yeah. has to be differentiated between plastic which is made and uh, not from fossil sources. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, plastic, which is biodegradable, this means by bacteria or. Yeah. Uh, yeah this, but this, this plastic, the also, also by the uh, also, uh, also, uh, plastic, these uh, uh, contain additive chemical, chemical additive that uh, reduce the time, time of the photoregulation. But the, the problem is the same because they. The macroplastic is predominant microplastic, the macroplastic in which the same the problem. But it is technology. Yes. That, that, that. We have this uh, discussion also within our SFP. So if we accelerate, for example, for plastic packaging, that it gets to microplastic. Yeah, this is, then uh, let's say we don't have the problem that we have this macroplastic everywhere. Yeah, so some scientists see a solution that if I show you this lake, uh, I have shown you the, the river, the plastic on the river, yeah, that if we accelerate for packaging that it gets to smaller particles, uh, then we have a solution that we don't have this 
macroplastic lying around. But this is not really a solution for microplastic. Yeah? This is an accelerated uh, development of microplastic. <laughs> yeah. uh, the solution can be only that, for example, bacteria or animals eat the plastic because it's converted to something what they can eat. Yeah? But for this, you have to get rid of polyethylene, polypropylene, PVC, uh, and, and all these mass plastics to substitute them. And that's very difficult. Yeah, because all, the, for example, PLA, the temperature stability of PLA is low and it's very brittle. And you need uh, elevated temperatures to degrade PLA. Yeah, so you need an industrial waste. Okay. And one comment is now, to date, uh, the oxodegradable uh, additives are not used in Europe. It's, uh, it's not possible to be used in Europe. And here, the new law, open the door for eight years, eight years. Okay, this is a dangerous situation, yeah. But is it working with we need to... Excuse me? Is it working also with, with non-polar polymers? Uh, for polyolefins, yeah. Yeah, principally, yeah. Okay, there, yes, one moment ask a question for the people in the, in the, in the cloud. <laughs> okay. The question is from Angela Maria Garcia. Thank you, Angela Maria. And uh, about the biotic degradation uh, that happened uh, uh, with the textiles, yes, uh, that uh, the textiles that arrived to the landfills. Uh, she asked about the, the, if this, this type of phenomenon is present in this type of textiles or the textile only forming um, contribute only with the laundry service. Yes. You mean with the, with the textiles, you have the problem that these filaments break? The, the, the first thing is that when the textiles arrive, arrive to the landfill, there are uh, uh, the, the biotic uh, response of the textiles in the, in the landfill. Yes, this is always a problem that, for example, uh, with landfill, also environmental unfriendly gases are developing. Yeah, and therefore, when landfill is definitely not a solution uh, because uh, of these issues that methane uh, is produced by landfill, by the degradation of these fibers. So because it is mostly polyester fibers, and uh, they develop a high amount of uh, methane during the uh, degradation and methane is not very good for the environment. Now, a local question. Okay. Please your name and... Okay, Camilo. Um, which are the uh, non-biological effects that um, can occur due to the presence of microplastics in blood, for example? Uh, textiles, there are not really any recycling concepts in the world. Yeah, I mean, if you look on the textile industry, uh, normally if you buy a new, new T-shirt, I should ask you to bring your own old T-shirt. Otherwise, you get no new T-shirt. <laughs> but uh, therefore, and these textiles are consisting of very different polymers and they are consisting in different shape. So therefore up to now, uh, there was a long report in the German TV about this textile industry, which has a recycling rate of nearly zero. Yeah? They deposited in Canada or in Germany, the textiles get burned. So uh, I think your question was in the direction, can we add something to the textiles? Uh, more like, which are the biological effects of having microplastics in blood, for example? I mean, if you have uh, microplastic in your blood, what is going to happen? Yeah. So what these scientists are stating is that you get somehow in the cells changes. Yeah, and then it's always a question if these cells which are changed get identified by the white blood cells. 
Yeah, and uh, you might get infections by this. But apps, at this time, there are one or three papers which are stating this. This means in the scientific community, uh, there is not an agreement that we say these microplastic particles are dangerous for human beings. Yeah, but last year, the first papers showed that they could identify these plastic particles in the blood of human beings. And now they study how is it possible that you find microplastic in the blood. And now they do estimations what might be the effect of this. Yeah, so this is very recent under investigation. Because when we studied the, the SFB, there was no microplastic any identified in the human body, only in cells. Yeah, so I showed single cells where you see within the body of the cell that there is a microplastic particle. And then this cell has around the microplastic particle, how to call it an infection, or it's, it's uh, don't know the English word. It's changed in the surrounding. Yeah, but an uh, important issue with microplastic in your body is that the microplastic might contain additives. This means low molecular substances which go into your body. Yeah, for example, phenols or, or, or something what you antioxidants. Yeah. And this means with micro, you get this in your body, uh, then uh, these antioxidants can easily move in your body, yeah? Or you can distribute in your body. Okay. Uh, I, I complement with the reflection about the nano, nano polymers in this case. Uh, part of the answer is uh, related with the evaluation of the nanomaterials and the superficial effects uh, and reaction with the, with, the, with the different objects, including the body. Yes, this is part of the, of the party that uh, is, is uh, related with a particular size, that is the nano, the nanoscale required to evaluate differently the, the phenomena, complementary with the phenomena related by Volker. Okay, okay. Yes, another question here. Thank you. Mm, good morning. Excuse me, I have a question. Um, how considering all the, like the control, like the capacity of the society to control all the plastic waste, is it better for the society to have a waste in macro-sized plastic, uh, plastic, excuse me, or micro-sized plastic. Thank you. So first, I already stated we did a lot of mistakes in the past to put somehow the macro-plastic into the environment. Yeah. So now. Uh, if you have the microplastic in the oceans, I think then the microplastic somehow belongs to everybody. Yeah, so it should not go into the ocean. This means we need in each country systems which make it impossible that somebody is throwing a piece of plastic in the environment. And uh, let's say in my lectures, I'm always showing to my students a picture from Africa in Johannesburg. There is a huge block where several thousand people are living. And these people in Johannesburg are used to throw their waste out of the window. This means if you look from, from an aircraft on this block where the people are living, they have a circle with waste. If you go to Hong Kong to the metro station where maybe 500,000 people are going a day. You don't see a small chewing gum. Yeah, this means these people in Hong Kong, they have to pay 1,000 uh, euro if they put a small piece of plastic somewhere. Yeah, so it's, it's a question of education and how you handle it in all countries. And uh, so 
uh, I think there are a lot of countries which really don't care for this because they have much more severe problems. This is a, yeah, I mean, but I think especially the countries which use most of the plastic, they should have the policy. Yeah, and most of the plastic consumption, I think Germany is number four, the United States is number one. Uh, I don't know where, where China is, but these countries which are the most consumers of plastic, they urgently need to have strong regulations. And China, meanwhile, has also a system introduced where plastic gets sorted, uh, waste gets sorted, and also plastic gets sorted. So they are really eager to improve. Yeah, but with Indonesia, I mean, there are not so many people and, and they have really completely different problems. Okay. Laura Valentina from the cloud also. Thank you for your question is, uh, is, there, is there any law that monitor the management of microplastic in the industry? What do you know? The primary microplastic. I, I mean, the, the, I, I guess it's in the direction of primary microplastic. And in, in, I think in the EU, it's forbidden. Yeah, so in the European uh, community, it's not allowed to produce any primary microplastic anymore, to put it in toothbrush or in cosmetics. It's absolutely forbidden. Yeah. But I mean, this is the same problem. I mean, worldwide, it's forbidden with ozone to use ozone, for example, for foaming. But there are still a lot of companies which use ozone. And there are, uh, for example, Germany has a special uh, department at police which checks products which are coming from other countries which might contain ozone. <laughs> Yeah. So even if you forbid it, uh, you need to have a system which control the law. Otherwise, you have a nice law, but still this primary micro microplastic. Okay, yeah. another local question. Sebastian, you are welcome. Uh, we have seen that uh, even the microplastic and nanoplastic are very harmful for our health or the health of other animals. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the ideal size of particles? So we consider that uh, a plastic like a plastic bottle could be harmless in terms of bi biodegradation. First, I think very important the plastic bottle does not contain additives which are harmful for human beings. Yeah, and uh, in the EU, we have a very strong policy uh, which additives are harmful and they get uh, substituted if possible. Yeah, uh, for example, there is a strong discussion uh, this is uh, bisphenols. Yeah, and and uh, in, in Germany, the higher number of children have problems with their tooth because uh, bisphenol in the body of these children, uh, they get very strange tooth which don't have the same strength like a regular tooth. Yeah, therefore we first need to control that no primary microplastic is produced anymore. And with the other plastic, that no additives are in plastic which are harmful for human beings if they get into the body in the way by microplastic. Yeah. One now, uh, general question is related with the uh, uh, extended uh, responsibility producer. Uh, it is the way in Germany appear well, is possible to be better in this case, which is your idea about this? <laughs> uh, um, this reminds me to the VW 
a diesel scandal. I don't know if you know this VW, this is an automotive company. Yeah, so uh, they produce cars uh, where the exhaust coming from the diesel uh, at certain running temperatures of the engine, uh, the nitrogen emissions were not, the N2 emissions were not suppressed. Yeah, and, and by this, I don't know how many million people got injured, uh, they got lung problems and so on. So now this was, I think, meanwhile, 12 years ago. Yeah, and today there was now a law case where they decided that uh, people who have such a car may give the car back. But I mean, the problem is if you have these laws, then really fight against huge companies which have a commercial interest to keep their products in the way as it is. I mean, the only way is, for example, I don't buy a VW anymore after this scandal. Yeah, and, and so a very clever way is that you check the companies from where you buy products. And I mean, we have the problem, you know, this glucosate problem. Yeah, so uh, if I buy, buy wheat for making bread, I check from where is the wheat coming. <laughs> Because in some countries, glucosate is still allowed. Uh, in Europe, it's not allowed anymore. But this is the only way, yeah? We don't live in an ideal world. We live in a real world and uh, the company interests are very often more important than the individual customer interests. That's reality. It's a, it's a real challenge to, to, to change the, the idea of the rentability uh, uh, to, to maintain the equilibrium, the sustainability, and uh, to, to think about the future of the society. Okay, yes, this is the same challenge here in Colombia. For example, the law that is recently produced it to, to prevent the use of only uh, used plastics um, was developed between the government, but the, the, the government, no. The, 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 the representant uh, in the camera that uh, is uh, with a style populist, yes, that plastic is dangerous, yeah, okay, <laughs> it's not good, yes. And the second one part is the industry. That means that the law is very good too, yes, <laughs> but fail in many things. The, the question is, is, is truly this type of laws effective to solve this type of situation? Yes? Okay. This is a, a good message for the people that <laughs> hear this type of message uh, in our governments, because it's plural, it's global, the problem. Yeah, this type of situation. Okay. Um, any other question or comment? Okay. Two comments. Thank you for all the people that arrived to this conference here in presence and in the web. One question uh, say, how many people? Uh, there are 51 people in the cloud and 14 uh, presence. Uh, it's a good number here. And uh, The second uh, information is related with uh, our responsibility to organize the 39th version of the Polymer Processing Society meeting in Cartagena de Indias in 2024, where the topic related with the sustainability is the special symposium of this event. You are welcome to this event and to reserve the date in May in 2024. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for all the people and Volker for your very good conference. And obviously, we continue with this. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye bye.